Gentlemen, welcome to the new studio. As you can see, it is not fully decorated, but nonetheless, nonetheless, I am excited. Obvious, hopefully, the echo is a little less than it had been before, uh, though I still need to get some sound proofing foam on the walls, and there's just a lot that still needs to happen. But I have a chair. Yeah, that's right. No more self-made standing desk for me. I have a chair with a real desk, like a grown-up. All right, guys, today we are checking out the Portuguese paratroopers, the Peracadistas, in heavy combat with African rebels in the Central African Republic. This is going to be a good one. Uh, let's get into it. This is from, by the way, the War Leaks uh, military. I think it's called War Leaks. Um, so yeah, do check them out on YouTube. Oh yeah, they have tiers, they have memberships. Okay, well that's that's cool. Yeah, I'm gonna leave this up because again, publishing some of this real war footage is not something YouTube monetization policies favor or are open to. So, you know, you should support them if you can. Okay, Portuguese paratroopers and heavy on African rebels in the CAR. Um, okay, so the Central African Republic is uh, one of the poorest countries in the world and I believe is currently fighting, I believe it's an Islamist insurgency, but it may be like a nationalist one. I think I may owe you guys that little bit of context. Let me see if I can get it for you. Uh, C-A-R insurgency. Uh, Oh, it's giving me the cars that you can play in uh, in Insurgency Standstorm. Okay. Uh, insurgency led by... Oh, no, it's an ongoing civil war. Okay, so this is a proper civil war. Selika Coalition and Anti-Balaka Militias. Okay. Um, all right, so this is... Sounds like it is uh, Chris... No, I don't think it's even religious. Yeah, I think it's it's just purely a sectarian civil war that has been ongoing for a long time. All right, let's crack it. Okay, so wow, we are catching, dropping right into the action. Let's uh, let's back it up a couple of frames. Okay, so these are the Pedicadistas. Uh, uh, Quartera, Quartera Fuerza Nacional. Destacada República Centro Africana. Okay, so this is the Airborne Fourth Force, like like Fourth, I guess forces, maybe like their ta their version of like a task force. Uh, National Force Destacada. I don't know what that I don't know what that means. Uh, any Portuguese speakers, help me out. And of course, uh, Central African Republic. Okay, so it looks like the insurgents have set up a what we would sometimes call a hasty blocking position this is obviously a roadblock um, and what will often happen is that a scout will uh, an enemy scout in this case will be sitting on the road they won't be armed they'll be in civilian clothes they may even be a old woman or a child right someone who would not necessarily alarm um, a the enemy and in this case the the portuguese right so they'll sit there and they'll see the Portuguese convoy pass. They will they'll determine the route that they're headed, and usually local like local insurgents will have a good idea of where the uh, in this case Portuguese are headed, and they will so that scout will call the insurgents and the insurgents will say, "I know they're going to the mosque. They're going to the government center." And they'll say, okay, we are going to throw up this roadblock to stop the vehicles. Then we're going to detonate an IED behind them to trap them in position with a burned vehicle behind and a blocked vehicle in front. These guys are obviously uh, recognized that this is an ambush and that the roadblock has not been set up properly. 
and they are accelerating and blowing right through it. This is a perfect response to an ambush, right? Is to accelerate, get out of what we call the kill zone. Okay, so it looks like they are using um, sort of U.S. military-esque or uh, true U.S. military Humvees, up armored. Um, looks like they were taking fire from this building on the right, probably. It's, I would suspect that maybe this ambush wasn't properly set and that they're encountering what was supposed to be the ambushing force ahead of the uh, blocking position. And so that's why the uh, insurgents have opened fire a bit early, right? Normally you would want to wait until the vehicles are perfectly perpendicular to your fields of fire, sort of like a broadside in the old naval combat, right? You don't want to shoot the ship when it's facing you. You want to wait till it's showing you the most amount of its hold, just like a convoy, right? A convoy coming at you looks like one Humvee. You want to shoot at it when it looks like five. Okay, not entirely sure why this person has dismounted. It's po usually if there's a dismount, there's some good reason to do it, right? It, it, Humvees are great, they are rolling cover. Atop a Humvee in the turret is usually a light machine gun or even larger weapon system. It, 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 there's not much reason to, to dismount unless a vehicle is disabled and you have to do recovery operations or there's a civilian or your objective is to uh, engage with and destroy the enemy. But it's important to note that there are some ambushes where a counterattack, a decisive counterattack, is the tactic to use, but it is very, very rare. You don't want to fight the enemy on their terrain, right? They've chosen the time, the place, and the terrain of the fight. So why you would give that to them if you have the ability to withdraw and fight them in another place in another way, um, to me is not the best call. Uh, okay, he was dismounting to fire what looks like uh, some sort of uh, anti-tank rocket launcher. Okay, so it looks like th there might be a disabled vehicle here, and I say that because you notice how now the two Humvees are forming a sort of defensive block, um, providing cover for this this camera vehicle. So it's possible the camera vehicle has become disabled, and that they are trying to establish some sort of defensive position so that they can do some vehicle recovery operations. And again, they're trying to shield this. Uh, anti-tank um the soldier with the anti-tank weapon again I'm the at4 or comparable yeah that really captures people forget you know the black blast area clear is not just uh you know, it's it's not this to prevent you from having your hearing damaged or your son, you know, getting a, a nasty burn. You saw that looked like a gunshot in terms of its power, and that is the rocket, the rocket's exhaust pushing backwards. So you can imagine the the velocity of that projectile going forwards. Okay, let's see, is this the same? This may be from a different angle, but I'm not certain. But again, these are definitely US, probably US made Humvees. Okay, so we saw the trail vehicle there, and now we're looking at, okay, it looks like they're maneuvering, uh, they're, they're dismounted, and they're advancing from behind the cover of the Humvee. Okay, so you noticed how the Humvee was pushing forward, Two of the pedicaristas were on either side of the Humvee, sort of facing to the side, probably to prevent any uh, insurgents from ambushing them. And then the cameraman was actually looking directly to the three. I imagine that he had a partner looking to the six, or sorry, he was looking to the nine, his partner was looking to the three on the opposite side. So it's kind of a unique stance. Um, 
but vehicle mounted dismounted operations are pretty delicate right and they involve a lot of coordination they're almost like a miniature combined arms operation but you can see just how powerful in urban combat just an armored vehicle with a turret and a mounted weapon on it is that that mounted troop can provide overwatch as dismounts maneuver those dismounts can protect the vehicle up close it really learning how to work mounted vehicles even something as, as simple as a humvee with your dismounted elements can totally be a game changer in a lot of urban or in this case like semi-urban combat <laughs> Okay, so let's see. So you can see there is your radio telephone operator. He is communicating with, it's tough to say, pro, I, I, I can't really understand, right? My Portuguese is, is not proficient enough to pick that up. And even if I did, right, just in the way that a lot of military lingo in, in English can be very esoteric, I imagine that it's the same way in Portuguese, right? So... He could be using call signs I don't understand or providing reports in a set format. Um, but he's either talking to headquarters or he may be talking to other elements that are currently maneuvering, right? There may be uh, groups of soldiers still with the vehicles, right? You could have the vehicles moving into a different position to provide overwatch as those dismounts maneuver. <laughs> Okay, you know you hear him speaking French. Uh, the CAR is a French-speaking country, so you, I imagine that because in Europe, if you've ever been to Europe, you know being multilingual way more common, and because all the Romance languages share a lot of base um, structures grammatical structures, it's much easier if you're a Portuguese speaker to pick up another Romance language like French. Uh, it's in fact so easy for Portuguese to pick up Spanish that at least when I was in Brazil, uh, you couldn't study Spanish as like a second language in university the way you can study, say, German or even Italian. Uh, it was just seen as uh, too easy to pick up. Um, you can almost it's almost mutually comprehensible when you read it though spoken it's incomprehensible without a little bit of uh without a, a decent amount of like training and education so what he is what they are trying to do is to get the people the civilians out of the building though the danger is you know there's civilians in there but there could also be insurgents. So they have probably their weapons trained, ready and watching if anyone who comes out is armed. But it's it's pretty scary and pretty dangerous and pretty delicate, right? Because you, you know, you could do, like we talked about in the Battle of Fallujah video, right? You, you could just enter with a bang. You could throw a grenade and then push in. But obviously you, you saw there were women and children in that building. And so they're trying their best to, to keep them safe. Okay, looks like they're running M4s. I'm seeing a flashlight. Let's see if we can get a better shot here. Be oh, those are not M4s. Those look like maybe some sort of updated FALs, maybe? Again, gun, gun nuts in the comments, let me know. Uh, but I am seeing uh, what looks like an M68 style close combat optic. I'm seeing a straight magazine that tells me it's Pry 762 NATO. This foregrip um, is pretty standard, but I think I saw a bipod where his hand is. So he's probably using that hand as like a foregrip to give him stability. Interesting. Look at this. This is this is novel. So you can see here that a uh, paratrooper is crouched in front using a ballistic shield that looks like it's probably pretty heavy duty, and he's using that shield to give additional cover to the person immediately above him who is providing some suppressive fire or engaging targets. This is pretty again 
pretty delicate operations. You can see someone behind him has his shoulder on him. This is my guess would be that this is a safety protocol, right? So that you say, okay, person on the ground, they are probably told, hey, you're gonna crouch and basically we're gonna fire our targets and there's a medium chance that you will be you will go deaf, right? If your headphones, your active headphones fail. And so they probably tell both of them, hey, if you're gonna do this, he's gonna crouch down, you're gonna stand directly over him, engage those targets, but you're gonna both wait for a tactile command from your team leader to withdraw, like stop firing, take a step back, that team leader will probably grab the shield man and physically lift them up so that the shield person knows that it is safe to stand. Okay, oh, look at, look at that, look at that, um, that uh, folding stock. It's actually just a, like, a, like an old school uh, paratroopers AK style uh, bent wire stock. That's kind of cool, I wonder if it's telescoping. Okay, also fascinating to me is that in the US military we are always trained weapons down especially when clearing a room. But you can see he has his barrel pointed skyward. Just a different protocol, not necessarily less safe, um, though I always have concerns about taking a barrel from up to a ready position, right? Sweeping it in this direction. I feel like it's safer to sweep from the bottom up. But again, I think this is, this is personal preference, right? Per not personal preference, but this is your unit, your country's, your military's, um, TTP. It can absolutely be done safely with the proper training. Okay, wait, wait, wait. We caught a little bit of that. Um, let's see if we can catch a little more. No, oh, what did I? What have I done? Get it together, Paul. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, he's saying that um, it kind of picked up in the middle of the transmission. He's saying five orange enemies in the trees. Um, so I so I don't know if five orange. Um, Cinco Laranja, Laranja is their call sign, um, or it could be uh, orange could be a status. It could be like red is maybe uh, they're engaging, and orange is hostile but not shooting at you, and green is like not. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Again, this is like the esoteric nature of military communications, and it's fascinating just how. They're obviously, their training is excellent, right? They're small unit tactics, they're, they're moving well, um, but so differently than US forces are trained. It's really actually pretty cool to see. Um, I think Van Bora, I think it was like Van Bora, Van Bora, I think, I think that's like Van Bora, like, I, I believe that means we're getting out of here. Like, let's go, we're going. I think, I might be misremembering, guys, it has been years since I have spoken Portuguese, so my translations may be bad, but this may signal that it's, the operation is wrapping up, or that things have heated up in a way that they, the paratroopers worry that, about them uh, losing, losing control of the situation. So if you're like, wow, there are a lot of people with cameras on, that is definitely true. And a lot of people, a lot of soldiers do have uh, their helmet cams for sort of personal record of, of the things that they've done, etc. 
Uh, really a pretty wild time, given that for most of history, uh, you were you were lucky if you could get regular mail to and from a front, let alone a live uh, live streaming video. But another reason is legal, right? Especially in UN operations uh, for European countries, oftentimes they are subject to extremely rigid rules of engagement. And in the event there are allegations, which are extremely common, uh, allegations of misconduct, you want to be able to offer hard video evidence that you haven't done the things you've said you've done. Great example, as you saw with them clearing people out of the building, it's possible that the insurgents deliberately kept women and children inside. So if there's video showing the pedacadistas saying, civilians, women and children, come out of the building. It shows that, hey, we did our absolute best to ensure civilian safety, and it's the insurgents who placed them in danger. It'd be a low pass from the southwest to the north. I'll copy. Oh, interesting. He's talking to uh, some sort of English-speaking forces. Again, testament. <laughs> you always feel. Like, I mean, people are like, "Oh, U.S. They don't. They're not multilingual." Listen, I'm gonna say up to a quarter, ten percent to twenty-five percent of U.S. forces are proficient in English and Spanish. So, I mean, that stereotype of like Americans only speak one language. I think it's going away. I think we're becoming a more multilingual country generally, and our military definitely becoming more multilingual. But it sounds like he is trying to coordinate, usually with air assets. I feel like the US generally provides these sort of high level air assets. It could all, yeah. There is a farm as planned, how copy? Mike, Okay, so you notice they said flashbang before throwing it, right? That's usually to let people know that it's that that pop is a grenade and or is a flashbang and not a grenade, and it's not like an enemy rocket or mortar. It's your twelve o'clock and your nine o'clock. The enemy are taking fire to us. How come? Yep, yep, there you go. Okay, you saw some air support from uh, either the US or that it was generally agreed upon that air support should be contacted in English. And man, it would be pretty wild to have to switch to a second language uh, to talk to aircraft. Uh, I'll say this, do not ask me to talk to an aircraft in Portuguese, because God help me, I don't even think I would know the word for like, north. I don't even think I know up, and that's where the aircraft are. My Spanish is now much better than my Portuguese. They are censoring out a lot of swearing. Wow, this looks like bad news. When you have your vehicles in this sort of circular defensive formation, that's usually when you realize that your only chance is to basically become as dangerous as possible, become a sort of porcupine, that the enemy just don't want any part of this fight with you. Uh, because again, remember, you have to, if you want to exfil, you have to exfil as a convoy. And given just the level of smoke and destruction, it sounds like the fight is pretty intense. Okay, I can't tell. They may be entering this compound in an effort to get in an even more defensible position or to attempt to exfil. Oh, no, I think they're using it to try to breach this compound. Oh, 
Okay, so this is really, so they, it looks like that was a building from maybe where they were taking fire, but the, they had to enter and clear it. You saw they shot off the lock before entering. That's, is that, I don't know what I would do there, right? I don't know if I would uh, use that method, right? It's pretty hard to actually hit the lock, even up close with your, with a, a rifle, right? That's why usually you use a shotgun with a, um, slugs to attempt to breach and destroy the hinges of a door before you kick it in. Now, they, it, what's scary about entering is that the enemy probably knows you're going to enter, and because they've locked the door, it probably means they were intent on dying in that room. So what's terrifying is that, of course, if you're going to die in a room, you'll probably leave some sort of present for the people that enter. Uh, so the risk of booby traps is Im incredibly high. Okay, looks like they found IED materials. Those look like 155 artillery shells. Uh, I'm going to point this out for the record. 155 artillery shells can easily be rigged to explode, or sometimes they just blow up because they're old Soviet made and not stored properly. So if you find it, what the US protocol is to do is to blow in place. That is to just blow them up so no one else can use them using additional explosives. Um, sometimes you will have your EOD personnel try to disarm them somehow but usually it's just about blowing it in place so it's extremely unusual and extremely dangerous to handle a possible IED or unstable ordnance by hand right in front of all your friendlies okay. okay looks like wow in eight tracked armored personnel carrier i don't even know what country that may be like a soviet made model um i'm really not sure i know the uh like bangladeshi forces are very commonly employed by the un because they're fairly professional and because of the uh poverty of bangladesh um the un's budget can actually get a lot of bangladeshi operations uh for a relatively low cost because of low soldier pay and um other low like other low cost of living things okay you saw that automated turret on the roof there right that is a crow system there's a camera mounted to it and it is looking out for the enemy while the crew remains safely inside <laughs> Yeah, okay, it looks like they've taken a casualty uh, and they are treating him right there or they have finally gotten out of combat and are stabilizing the casualty but you can see the vehicles are pulled up on either side to provide some cover and usually what they will do in this situation is get the casualty as stable as possible tourniquets restore blood pressure start a start an iv um, whatever they can in to do emergent treatment and then get them in a vehicle ideally that un uh, carrier because it had troop carrier because it has a fairly large back you could almost lay a casualty there sit in the seats and work on them uh, and prepare to extract so they may be securing a landing zone and will be medevacking the casualty. No, I'm sorry, I was wrong. This is just bad footage. They're preparing a mortar. Phew, that's good. I prefer that. Okay. Yeah, this is so grainy, I I can't even tell you at this point. I mean, that's just, look how much smoke there is here. This has been a true massive gunfight. Uh, 
Okay, so that was interesting. That was a white painted gunship, I guess, a UN helicopter. So I've never seen a UN, a US painted helico- helicopter painted white like that. Um, so I imagine that perhaps it is a foreign nation. It also didn't look like a US military um, uh, Apache or even a Cobra. So I suspect that it may be. Um, another country on the, as a part of, that's a part of this UN mission where their only language that they share is English. Oh yeah, that's um, that's some Russian-made helicopter, I think. Okay, he's just calling out what he sees. He just said there's a there's a motorcycle. I think he said 30 meters behind us. Uh, okay, so this is actually them relaying information to and from their escort helicopter, I believe, right? So somewhere up he- around here, I can't really see because of the fidelity, but that that those air assets are watching the convoy move and are looking out ahead of them, looking behind obstacles, basically provide being their eyes in the sky. Okay, that really annoys me. You see the 50 cal is pointed almost directly at the lead vehicle. One, the lead vehicle is going to have your lead sector of fire, right? Your second vehicle is going to have a sector of fire to the right or to the left. Third vehicle will, right, you'll, you'll divide up the sectors of fire so that one, no one's weapon is pointing at anyone else's vehicle. And two, so that at the entire 360 degrees are covered. <laughs> Not sure what he was shooting at there. Uh, okay, they have to stop. Right, so this is, this is I think, pretty common um, in actually what are called defenses in depth. And, or, uh, de- what are they called? Delays, I think. And this is where you don't want the enemy, you just want to slow the enemy's advance. Right, you want to stop them from advancing t- into your position rapidly, and so what you do is you do that by exploiting their protocols in response to combat. Right, these are usually called their like formation deployment formations or combat formations. So you saw they were moving in that straight convoy; they were moving right along in a good clip when someone takes a pot shot at them, and you see they have to light it up. Right now, they've all stopped. They're clearing the surrounding buildings. They're going to do what's called a BDA, a battle damage assessment. There's just going to be a lot that has to happen. So what you've done is you've stalled that convoy for 30 minutes or more while possibly, based on the fact there's four more, five more minutes of this video, uh, possibly while you prepare a proper ambush further into the battle space. Wow, yeah, they all have that weapons up clear room clearing protocol that's fascinating also interesting did you notice how the gunner has a shotgun right in front of him right he's got his 50 cal and then for closer engagements that the 50 cal is too close for he has a shotgun that is also pretty wild Yeah, okay, there you are clearing that room, right? Whenever you want to clear a room, you want to make sure you have inside and outside security. You don't want to enter an area and not know if the enemy is literally surrounding the building as you clear it. So you want to have your friends providing security on the outside.
Okay, so that looks like a deployment of an irritant like tear gas, right? This is probably to just saturate the area in this irritant or to cover their escape, right? To prevent the enemy from being able to see the vehicles as they withdraw. Okay, also wild. This is maybe drone footage or maybe just IR footage from the helicopter. What's fascinating to me is, look, he has what look like basically just iron sights on his uh, saw, it looks like. So, yeah, pretty interesting uh, call there. <laughs> Okay, by by combat patrol standards, these guys are hauling ass, and I don't know if maybe they're low on fuel and they're they're just decided, hey, we are going to push through enemy fire. We're not going to stop and deploy and engage. <laughs> I can't tell if those were two IEDs going off or if those were just a gunner taking shots. Well, somebody's shooting back at something. There's the crow system in action. Yeah, that's the power of that automated system, right? It's done with zero risk. And you saw how big those targets were, right? Compared, to, and those could have been hundreds of meters away, but you could see clear as day the weapons they were holding. They just really didn't even know that they were close enough to the fight. They were, you know, but. Yeah, it was that easy. It's a really powerful tool. Okay, I give these guys credit. They have been in a lot of action and they're still pushing forward, right? I, 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 I don't really know what the intent of this operation is, but they are definitely getting after it. And they are not letting a lot of, even a considerable amount of combat stop this mission. But this looks like some sort of uh, enemy encampment, right? This is, yeah, I'm very curious. Okay, gotta say, if, if you are an insurgent and you are operating a camp, you don't want it to have a blue tarp on the roof. Now there's an exception, and that exception is if you want your camp to blend in with the surrounding area, right? So the fact that you have a mysterious camp with a lot of military age men in it, deep in the jungle, probably is an indicator that it's an insurgent camp, right? It's definitely not a Starbucks. And in contrast, if you operate in a main town in the back room of like a local storefront, you're just going to blend in. So if you were to set this up, you would want to look exactly like every other farmer's hut or every other small village. Yeah, this is this is just a, a asking to get discovered. Which if it's got booby traps and is a, is bait, maybe you do. Oh, interesting. It looks like he, this, he has a, some, now that looks like the same FAL, but the shield person, the shield carrier has a, um, has a submachine gun. Oh, this is rich. The insurgent camp has tarps provided by the UNHCR. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, it looks like they are searching uh, and trying to gather intel, right? If you can, sometimes even if a place is deserted, you can infer how many people live there by, for example, the number of different sets of clothing, number of different pairs of shoes, different sizes. You can tell if it's all men, if there's children's sizes, if there's women's clothing. Even the amount of food there can help you discern how many people are there and how often they are, and how recently they've left. Taking intelligence from a site is, is what the term in the, mil, in the US military is exploitation. You're exploiting that site. Oh, okay, you notice he said um, that there's, there's more drugs. So he found some sort of, it looks like a personal stash of of drugs um they also had two solar panels so it's tough to say is it, it, it is this some sort of commercial drug operation is it rebels funding their operations through narcotic or drug production or is it just personal use um you know obviously if you're running a guerrilla operation you may not have the highest caliber of fighter <laughs> Uh, very curious on who is withdrawing right now. This may be like walking wounded, or it may be if someone has really valuable intel, they may want them out of there much quicker. Yeah, that was probably like a walking wounded that was getting out of there. I just want to point out that multicam has been such a hit that literally every single military has basically adopted it. Even Russian Spetsnaz forces in Syria are rocking multicam now. But as a testament, a lot of the best light infantry gear is made by commercial manufacturers, and they're going to make it in the most popular patterns, which are multicam. So if you want to make sure you blend in, that's how you got to do it. Guys, that was some intense stuff. Holy cow. Holy cow, you guys. Um, wow. Shout out to the Paracadistas. Those guys are legit. I want to learn more about Portuguese operations in the CAR. Uh, obviously, Portugal and Africa has a pretty uh, rough history, but uh, you can't argue with the fact that the fighting forces, the Portuguese military, in at least this video, really got after it and were pretty quintessential professionals about it. Uh, so guys, thanks so much for watching. Be sure to hit subscribe, like the video. Also, subscribe or follow me on Twitch. I'm going to start streaming there on a regular basis. And other than that, guys, I hope you like the new studio. Like I said, slowly it'll start to come together. And until next time, I'll see you guys later.